I remember being quite enthused over balloons as a child. Picture this for a moment. A nine-year-old pointing across the path to a man who seemingly carried all the answers to our problems, appearing about as downcast as the evening weather. The balloons he carried were hardly simple ones, those boring, gaudy shades of bright rubber, leaving absolutely no one impressed anymore. It was time for something new, for, dare I say, a change. Did I mention that these weren't your ordinary balloons? Within the confines of a transparent spherical cage, wrapped in these stretchy pseudopodian-shaped prickles, was a small rubber creature. It could have been real for all it was worth, with the way I wished to free it from its confines, watching it bounce about at the end of the stick that I held. On second thought, perhaps having a live animal at the end of a flimsy rod in the hands of a nine-year-old isn't the best idea. No wonder we don't have pets at home. My current disappointments aside, the one thing that everyone, including my very anxious parents, could sigh with relief over was the fact that this balloon just wasn't about to fly off anywhere. Helium balloons have a tendency to do that, fly away with the wind, so to speak. And while it was probably the most amount of freedom that balloon would have ever had in its entire lifespan, that's a humbling thought, it's an ineffable annoyance when it comes to children with the slightest case of the butterfingers and a penchant for the violently dramatic when it came to acquiring the things that they so desperately wanted. A very tragic combination for anyone involved. So unlike the helium balloon my brother had let go of the previous day, a tear glistening at the corner of his eye, this balloon just stayed in a corner of our living room. It faded into obscurity as the days, the weeks, the months passed by, and suddenly it just wasn't there anymore. When we peeked back the curtain to take a look at the antiquities when we were like shifting our house over, we saw what happened to be a reluctant memory or sibling blackmail material when that mattered. But now it doesn't, and all that's today is cannon fodder for today evening speech. All in due time, I suppose. While we're on the subject, time has not an ounce of respect for anyone who doesn't pay up the due amount of it. But how it affects you depends on whether you choose to rise above your past with a flourish, fly with the winds, or whether you choose to sit down and accept the status quo, taking what it takes one step at a time. And thus, it begins. The winds of change. It's interesting to consider the human mentality towards change as a whole, because accepting it in all its multifaceted disguised forms at first glance is not only rare, but unlikely. This aversion to change could stem from all kinds of things, for instance, an assured certainty of events to come, what it could mean for your headspace, for those you love, some semblance of control. And for some people, it's some reasons more than others. That's perfectly all right. Humans are hardwired to resist changes. It's how our neural connections are set up. Even monkeys like change better than we do, according to some studies. Maybe that's why we evolved from chimps, and now we're just stuck here in this form of limbo. But I digress. Taking whatever comes one step at a time is instrumental to a fruitful existence because it is inevitable that something of the sort will walk over, stick its foot out, watch you trip with a casual indifference, and the only person left to pick up the pieces will be you, yourself. It's hardly circumstantial. This universe that we live in, this much larger unknown entity that we don't even know much about in the first place, is expanding each and every day, at least according to the Big Bang Theory. This theory said that the universe began at a time when time wasn't a thing at all and just expanded into existence one day. A complementary theory called the Big Crunch also predicts the end of things as we know it, where the universe would shrink in itself and cease to exist forever. However, to test that theory, it's still 15 billion years down the line. We should be fine, right? It's completely out of our purview, not quite relevant to our existence as we know it. In fact, I think it would take 15 generations of humans to wipe ourselves out 15 times over just so we can get to that particular stage. So let's talk about something a little closer to us. The sun, aging gloriously like fine wine, the closest cosmic wonder to us. Except, no it isn't, it's due to explode in a few billion years or so. At the same time, it's not something we can hope to change, right? So let's talk about something we can change. Our planet, the state of our planet. This planet, trembling under the misguided view of what it should be, struggling to provide for a vision that it cannot hope to or even wishes to support any longer. And while all of this is happening, while gears creak their way to prominence as decades fly by, we'll still be here. 
in our little boxes, arguing over green slips of paper and our petty senses of self-worth, while everything else just goes up in the air. Time moves along with different stakes and different paces. Relativity is hauntingly beautiful in that way. However, it will affect us one day, or is affecting us right now as we speak. There are things that work while we preen, things that don't have half the sense to wait until we're ready to face them head on. This anorexic infrastructure will suffer another purge, one that it can't hope to return from. This planet will wilt, it will shrivel, and yet no one will pay heed to the warnings completely before it's too late, before this olive branch that we stand upon with our foolish complexes and pride will crumble under the miserable responsibility that we've thrust upon it. So until we look past these glaring issues in our simplistic societies, in this simplistic picture, the larger picture can never be taken into account or pointed at with a certainty. Think of it as an unboxed jigsaw puzzle, one that you've never seen before. Unless you begin to put together smaller parts of it and connect them with threadbares of thought, you will never be able to point with a certainty at what the larger picture is even supposed to remotely look like. And just as it takes your fingers attached to a hand, attached to a full arm hanging off an organism, it will take the collective strength of everyone involved to even make a dent in what time has planned for us. And if it's hard to accept, if it's hard to see what some see with a grim determination and campaign for each and every day, do not write it off as blasphemy. Everyone has a similar set of appendages, a mind that is capable of comprehending the world in so many different ways. And so do you. If I was to point behind me right now and tell you that's the color black, you would probably agree with me. It is the color black, right? But I would never truly understand the sentiment that you assign to the color black. I would never truly understand the way your cells comprehend the color black. And I could never write off the way you acknowledge the color black because that would be hypocritical and I'd have to write off my own view of that as well. Then we'll have an existential crisis on our hands. We don't have time for that. It's a matter of perception. It's a matter of being able to borrow someone else's telescope or something else's telescope and see through it, no matter how much limited time you have whether you see what it is that you thought you would never see and were enlightened forever, or whether you saw a demented reflection staring back at you through shattered lenses, you still saw that change in view. We didn't shrink within these self-erected barriers and sit within ignorance. And neither did you fly away with the idea either. That's irrelevant to the matter at hand. What's relevant is that you accepted that change in view. You saw it for what it was and drew judgments based on that rather than someone else's words. And in the end, if we are united by anything, it is by our need for survival and our collective humanity. The duo sometimes pose as two sides of the same coin. If we can bring these things together under the larger umbrella of the larger scheme hovering above our heads like a guillotine set to fall any moment, we might have a chance at averting that crisis. We might have a chance at coming together and stopping time in the technical sense, of course. To part ways today and commence the acknowledgement of what is already at play, I like to end with a stanza from Amanda Gorman's Change Sings. I hear change humming in its loudest, proudest song. I don't fear change coming, and so I sing along. Thank you.